Hi, so we've been looking in previous videos at uh, electric motors, in particular configuring those motors to be generators. And we've been looking at this kind of thing. This one is um, a motor from a printer, and you can see it's got a ring magnet in there, and that, in this case that's the um, stator, and then we've got, sorry, that's the rotor. Then we've got this thing here, lots of coils wind around, it's basically an electromagnet, that's the stator, that's the rotor. They fit together like that, this is held flat, you pass a current through that and that will rotate. And obviously if we do the opposite of that, we rotate that, then we can get a current out of that uh, by the induced current of the magnetic field lines cutting the coils. So that is the kind of motor that we've been looking at. Now it doesn't represent um, the most popular kind of motor. The most popular kind of motor actually is the induction motor. And here's one I took from a drill actually. Now I take that to pieces, then you look at the inside of it, here we've got the rotor in this case and the stator in this case. Now it looks very similar to the one that we've got in that we can pass a current down here to create a magnetic field in the stator and then we pass an opposite current using the brushes and the commutator just there to pass the field on there, creating another electromagnet. So instead of using permanent magnets, we use two electromagnets to do essentially the same job. And the requirement of that, obviously, is commutation. On these ones, then we can actually use electronic commutation, so they're brushless motors. These ones actually have these little brushes in them, making them a brushed motor. So that one, actually, I think is relatively easy to understand. You, you, we know what's going on there. Create an electromagnet. And we can create an electromagnet by passing a current. But equally, they are not particularly popular in that style because it uses brushes, and those brushes wear out. And what you find an awful lot of is um, this kind of motor. This one I actually took from um, a mixer, I think. And if I take that to pieces... It's going to look something similar to the um, electric motor that we just looked at, but it's got something really weird in it that kind of makes it difficult to understand. And I think it's because it's difficult to understand that you find a lot of DIY projects using uh, variants of this kind of motor, and very, very few indeed using variants of this kind of motor. And most of the projects, what they do is um, drill the motor out and put magnets in to effectively make this into this. That's what they try to do. If I take that out, what we'll see is there is our stator, and it's as we expect. It's a couple of field coils, and we generate um, a magnetic field with that by passing an alternate current down it. So that we understand. The really weird one is this. This, actually, um, has no connection at all. It, it doesn't have brushes, it has no coils on it, and yet when we pass a current down there, that will rotate. And th that's a mystery. Why, why that actually works is, is really, really mysterious. Uh, and I think it's one of the reasons that what people have been doing with this is drilling holes in it and gluing magnets in, and then when you can spin that, you can make that into a um, generator. Like that, if we just put that in there and spin it, because there is no magnetic force on there, then it won't do anything, it won't generate, and I guess that's why people are gluing magnets to it. Or they replace the entire thing with a, another magnet. But these kind of motors, which are induction motors as well, are absolutely fascinating. Now I've got a, an even bigger version of one here that we can see a little bit better. And this I took from a wet grinder. We pull that to pieces. There we go. Okay. State is as you expect. There's a whole load of coils in there. No surprise there at all. And here is the rotor. Now, if you look on that rotor, you can see little lines going down on that rotor in this packed shell. This shell is made up of thin laminations of steel. And those lines are actually electrically conductive with each other and joined up in loops, so they're shorted at the ends here. So all of these lines are effectively little circuits. Now what happens is when you put a current in here, then the field will induce a current in here. Now we can only use things with AC, because we let that alternate current drop then that field will drop, and this field here will also drop, and that will induce a current. 
So the magnets, if you like, the electromagnets themselves are self-contained in this tiny little circuit in the rotor. And, and that kind of foxed me for ages, so I think, certainly think it foxes people. But there is no way of making a connection to that, and a connection isn't needed. Because when that, field, um, that current stops, it will also generate its own collapsing magnetic field. Now, that's really curious when you think about it, that we're inducing a field without actual contact. But it's very similar to how a transformer works. Now, a transformer can have a gap between one part of the transformer and the other. As long as they're close enough, they will magnetically couple. And putting an AC current down on one side will produce an AC current on the other side of the transformer, even if there's a tiny gap there. But sometimes they put a gap in deliberately, uh, and that's things like flyback transformers. So effectively, it's a kind of transformer with a very small circuit, and these lines are, in fact, the circuit. Now, if I were to do that, then just like a flip transformer, it won't move because there's no actual force on it. What I need to do is get that field to rotate in here. And I can do that if I use an alternate current. So as that alternate current drops down again, if I start another alternate current 90 degrees out of step of that first alternate current, then I will get a force on this because of the time lag difference. And that difference in force will in fact lead to rotation in this. That's very cool. Now you often find these thing, things in three phase AC because the AC feed is giving you that rise and fall in steps of 120 degrees and that will create the force on that and just spin that magnet. But you also find these in um, single phase. Now in order to have a single phase of these what you need to do is um, lapse the field by at least 90 degrees and you can do that just by putting a capacitor on one. So this one actually has two sets of windings. It has a um, primary winding where the main phase is going in and then what's called an auxiliary winding where the capacitor feeds it and it's in the auxiliary winding that you um, get that starting motion because a phased motor like this will actually turn if I start it by hand. So if I just feed that phase in and give it a spin, it'll continue to spin. If I put the auxiliary winding in there, it makes itself starting. So there's a single phase induction motor. Now, equally, there is nothing on that, on that rotor at the moment. So if I spin that, I'm not going to get a current out of it. I have to do something to get a current out of it. And again, people have been drilling holes in it and gluing magnets on. But actually, you don't need to. You can do this just by using a couple of capacitors. And I've got a couple here. These are microwave oven transformer capacitors. Incidentally, they're about a microfarad each, and they're a couple of thousand volts. In order to make this work properly, you need a um, couple of hundred volt um, capacitors, so about 400 volts, uh, because this one's actually a 240 volt motor. <clears throat> about 400 volts and about 100, 200 microfarads, something like that. So you'd need a, quite a few of those. We'd get it working with this, which is what we're going to actually do. Now this motor is really kind of cool because it tells you on the diagram how to actually connect these things. So this capacitor that I'm putting on at the moment is the one that will feed the auxiliary winding, creating that 90 degree out of phase step. Here are my main power. This used to go into the mains. If I connect that up to the multimeter, I'll get absolutely nothing, even if I spin that, because there's just no magnetic field. However, if I connect that, I'm looking for cables, here we go. If I connect that with the capacitor, there is enough residual magnetism in that rotor to start a tiny, tiny charge, and that charge will build up and be stored in the capacitor. And then that stored charge will create a magnetic field within the rotor, and then it will build up and actually generate, which I think is super, super cool. There are a couple of limitations with this, incidentally. Because that field 
has a specific time that it rises and falls. And for us, obviously, it's uh, 50, 50 hertz here in Europe. I think it's 60 hertz in the US. It might be the other way around. But there's a fixed time that these things work. And there has to be a lag between the uh, rotor and the stator. And that lag's called the slip, and that gives a force on it that will turn it. And it's really rated at a fixed speed. So they tend to be about um, 14, 15, 1800 RPM. When you run them at that, then they're absolutely incredible motors. They are, in fact, the motor that you find in, in electric vehicles at the moment, for obvious reasons. They're cheap and robust. And they don't use magnets. <laughs> They find them a lot in those kind of things. As a generator, which is what we're rigging up here, incidentally, as a generator, then we have a limitation on speed, just like we have a um, speed limitation. Now, there are ways of varying that called variable frequency drives uh, for a motor. For a generator, it will be a motor as long as it has uh, that positive slip. That is, it spins at less than or up to its rated spinning speed, let's say 1500, if, if it was uh, 50 hertz. If we spin that at 1550 or 1560, then it has a negative slip and the reverse happens. It actually becomes a generator. So we can make that a generator if we feed a current into the device prior to getting it up to speed. Now that might seem like a hell of a lot of things to do in order to get that to generate, but the current you need to feed in is tiny compared to the current that you get out because you're adding in the motion of the rotation by the load that you're putting on this. Now it is also um, self-leveling. It, it won't exceed its load. It can only get up to a certain amount and then it just doesn't get any higher. So it's self-protective, which is great when you think about a wind turbine, for example, where you've got that variability and if it's too fast, you can blow your motor or your uh, electronics. Here, you can't do that. Like I say, the amount that you have to put in is very, very tiny. And that's the point of connecting the capacitor uh, in line with the actual motor output. Is initially, with that in residual magnetism, then we will get magnetization of that rotor. That will feed back into here, which will feed back into there, and continue that build up until there's an excess. And then an excess, we can draw off as actual power under load. So to demonstrate that, obviously I've just connected the whole thing up. What I'm going to do is give you a close-up of that and spin that motor. Okay, so I'm just going to spin this by hand, and there's the voltage reading there. It's an AC output, incidentally. And if I just give that a little spin, then... <laughs> just by twiddling that with my fingers, which really is not the best, I can get that up to about a volt of output. Okay, so that's quite a bit of fun. Um, it is actually tremendously easy to turn one of these mo motors. It's called a squirrel cage, incidentally. Um, when it's like that, that's a squirrel cage rotor. In order to turn one of these squirrel cage inductor motors into a generator, it's actually really, really easy. You don't have to go around drilling holes and gluing magnets onto the thing. All you have to do is put a capacitor in parallel with the motor. When you do that, it becomes self-starting and a generator. That's actually very, very cool. Now, to know what kind of capacitance you put in there, oh, I don't really know. All I did was stick capacitors on there until it actually worked. And <laughs> once it worked, I was happy. Uh, I, I guess there's a way of calculating it. I have no idea. Hopefully, somebody can post that for me. That would be awesome if there was a post on that. Um, it is limited by speed. You do have to get it above that um, rated speed. So if it's rated at 1500, then you do have to get it around about 1550, 1600, and then it's actually a really good generator. But even spinning that by hand with a capacitor um, in parallel with it, then we can get a few volts out of it. And if we get that at the right speed, actually, there's a dramatic change. There's, there's this point at which the torque curve becomes incredibly um, stable 
And so you can put a load on it at that stage. If it was spinning in my hand, if we put a load on, we would just kill it. Um, if we get it up to speed and we get on that point of the torque curve, we can actually put a very high load on that and it will continue to generate and feed back into it without you having to drill things out and glue magnets in. So there we go. I hope that was of interest, but that's how to convert uh, a squirrel cage induction motor into a generator by sticking a capacitor on. I hope that was of interest and thank you very much for watching.